Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, today, myself, um, Lance, and Brian, who's walking up, will be talking about um, some SQL Server um, and uh, SQL Server related topics, uh, some features, um, and also I would like to give you guys some uh, information about. How okay. SQL Server, these uh, mentioned SQL Server uh, features perform on Intel and how what we do behind the scenes with SQL engineers to optimize those. So, um, Brian, you want to come up and introduce yourself and present? For oh. a second. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so, uh, uh, I'm Lance Wright. I'm a. No, all good. Uh, I'm a product manager at Microsoft working on Arc-enabled SQL servers. Uh, so yeah, excited to talk to you about uh, you know, Arc-enabled SQL servers, and we're so grateful for our partnership with Intel. Uh, so yeah, we're looking forward to the discussion. And uh, once we get Brian mic'd up here, we'll have him kind of get us all kicked off, and we'll get going. All right, and meanwhile, I'll introduce myself. My name is Mohamed Akhtar Soglu. I am a software performance engineer working at Intel's Microsoft Technology Center. Uh, we work closely with our SQL Server partners and um, basically try to bring you, uh, bring the SQL users on, on, on cloud, on-prem, and uh, all the latest technologies and goodness of the Intel products. Awesome. So. All right. We got you all mic'd up now, Brian. Keep talking, probably. Yeah. Okay. There you Excellent. Go. Uh, yeah, my name is Brian Carrick. I'm a program manager at Microsoft, uh, working mainly on onboarding uh, next generation of hardware for Azure SQL DB. Awesome. Sounds good. And uh, yeah, do you want to go over our agenda? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, after the introductions, what we were going to talk about is a brief review from uh, Brian for the SQL, 2000, uh, SQL Server 2022 features, and following that, I will you know give you guys some sneak peek into the performance of our upcoming uh, uh, Xeon platform performance. And um, tied to that, we're going to also talk about a new feature that we announced last year with the SQL 2022 release, uh, namely the uh, backup compression acceleration using Intel's QuickAssist technology. And um, the final topic will be um, uh, covered by Lance here. Uh, he'll be talking about SQL Server uh, enabled by Azure. Awesome. Sounds good. So, Brian, I think you're kicking us off. Take it away. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, my name is Brian Carrick. I've been working with uh, SQL Server in various capacities for about 17 years now, and uh, uh, recently working as a PM on board new hardware for uh, Azure. Um, so just a, uh, just a quick overview of SQL 2022. Um, uh this this is our kind of slide uh, a single slide representation of uh sql server um and uh on the um, on the right we have the orchestration and automation tools we're coming familiar with, with like kubernetes uh in the middle section we adhere to our motto of developing once and deploying anywhere uh, whether that be SQL in containers, SQL in bare rental, uh, on Linux, SQL in Windows or multiple other permutations of the above and uh, finally uh, we moved our, from the intelligent edge then all the way to the intelligent cloud we expand our options. We've got SQL on uh, infrastructure as a service uh, to purely uh, 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 PaaS or platform as a service offerings like Azure SQL Database and uh, Hyperscale. 
<laughs> I, I'm, I'm... <laughs> right. Uh, I want to start with a little poll. Um, how many of you, in one um, way or another, uh, do SQL Server optimization directly? Good. And how many of you do that on a platform level? Like you're going into the, you know, cloud instance settings and platform settings, BIOS settings, perhaps. All right. So uh, my name is Mohamed Akhtashul. I'm an Intel engineer. So my talk is going to be mostly focused on a bit more on the lower level side of things. So as I mentioned earlier, my team works closely with SQL Server engineers. And we want to just show, give you guys some heads up. And as far as I know, um, these performance numbers, the comparisons that we do to our previous generation or the current and uh, newest generation hardware, this is the first time that is being uh, publicly announced. Uh, so it's a little, um, you know, uh, special announcement for past community here. Um, so um, what I'm going to talk about mainly is, is three different data points. Um, we're going to look at a quick look at the performance improvements that we get with uh, Intel's uh, fifth generation Xeon hardware compared to the fourth generation on um, uh, high, high volume um, transaction um, processing centric workloads, as well as data intensive um, analytical workloads. And also we'll give another data point on um, the recently um, released feature uh, for, 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 for SQL 2022 that enables uh, SQL users to utilize hardware installation for uh, backup compression. All right, so the first one is um, our OLTP workload. So um, in the new generation of the, uh, the Xeon platforms, in the new processors, uh, we have many new um, uh, microarchitectural improvements. And um, we are we are measuring in our own labs a 10% improvement on, on the throughput of high highly um, uh, high in high intensive OLTP type workloads. Uh, so what does that mean? That means that the, the, we're continuing our uh, partnership with SQL Server to give, bring uh, the SQL users the best performance that you can get and get the uh, most ROI for your investment in the in the new platforms. Um, Essentially, if you look at the look at our decades-long, um, multi-decade-long uh, partnership with Microsoft, you would see that a proven performance track record of performance scaling for SQL Server across many platforms on, on Intel, um, and this is just a continuation of it, right? So, in the fifth generation, we are also seeing that trend continue up. And if you can squint your eyes and read, uh, if you're able to read the little uh, footprints at the bottom, you would see that you know this 18% performance. Where is it coming from, right? Um, I, I'm a performance geek, so if you let me talk, I will, you know, take hours to talk about it, but I'll call it short for you. But the high-level um, analysis on this performance improvement is that we are getting in, the, in, the, in this experiment, we are using a, a, the, a part that has basically four more physical cores than the uh, fourth-generation processor that we use. So what does that mean? That's about 7% more number of cores. So, and we are looking at an 18% performance improvement, right? So uh, the performance gap, or like the... the, the Overscaling aspect of it just shows how good, uh, like, what type of like, you know, good improvements that we bring in with the fifth generation of the Xeon platform. There are a lot of uh, microarchitectural improvements, and we are excited that uh, we we can demonstrate through the performance. I'll uh, I'll 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 take the questions at the end of the at the presentation, but yeah, please note that. Mm -hmm. um, so, but yeah, so this is 18% performance improvement for high intensive, um, you know, highly you know uh, high volume. RTP like a broker-like transactions, um, and when we will look at the um, performance on the all app side, essentially a data warehousing application that um, churns lots of data, and I'm talking about tens of terabytes of data here. Uh, we see still the same type of scaling, so the the same goodness, um, the same work that we do to make sure that the SQL Server performance scales with the new uh, technologies, the new cores that we introduce, the new Technologies that we introduce in our machines are reflected in the end end result for your um, data intensive workloads. <clears throat> it's funny that these typically don't align, like you know, the eighteen percent both both uh, show the eighteen percent performance, but you know, um, stars align, I guess. Um, but yeah, 
this, this, the, like I said, like, uh, there's a lot of technologies in terms of like, you know, uh, utilizing AVX instructions for column sort index, uh, instructions. We talked about this in the last year's pass, um, um, but that, that trend continues and that, that translates into performance very well. And the last data point that I want to give you is the um, performance improvement that you would get if you were to use the newly introduced um, compression acceleration technology from SQL Server 2022. Um, so what you're looking at here is a performance comparison of a uh, compressed backups. In one case, we are using uh, default compression, you know, uh, the good old uh, compressed backups method that you used to have before 2022. And on the right side, you'll see uh, the performance improvement uh, that you get by offloading uh, the compression overhead to, to um, Intel's quick assist technology. So starting with the fourth generation platforms, this, uh, this accelerator became a part of the chip, chip itself. So when you have a, a fourth generation or fifth generation um, hardware, you can utilize this feature. If you don't have that feature, which you know Brian shortly will talk in detail about it, how to make use of it, you can still get some performance improvements and you know better uh, compression. So, but I want to also drill down a little bit about this, like you know, 2.5x performance improvements. Like, what does it mean for the end user, right? Um, if you think about it, the the the, the compression. I, what I hear um, from from most SQL users, the the main reason that you wouldn't do compression is that it's a big overhead. It's a big CPU consumption. Uh, it takes longer, much longer, to execute compression or execute compressed backups than your regular backups, right? If you enable compression, you're not going to uh, fulfill your SLAs, your, your basically uh, business continuity strategy is at risk, right? If you cannot finish a, you know, your backup in time. With this type of performance improvement, we are bringing the compression uh, you know, to the use of the end users, right? So there, there now there's the possibility for, for your scenario uh, to go and enable compression, which will have a multitudes of uh, improvements for uh, not just the performance of obviously the quicker <coughs> uh, backups, but also you will save on storage. Um, the smaller data means less network overhead. Um, uh, you will uh, free up, if you, if you do this through an accelerator, you will free up the CPUs. That is the most res uh, uh, useful re uh, resource on your platform uh, that you want to dedicate to your critical workloads, right? You don't want to disrupt your workload. So this enable this uh, this feature checks all those boxes and brings all those goodnesses to you. Um, and um, those are the you know performance numbers I want to uh, bring up. And I think now Brian is going to talk about a little bit more about the QAT technology, how you can use it, how you can utilize in your in your uh, uh, production environments. So, uh, back, as I mentioned, backup enhancements in SQL Server 2022 um, leverage uh, the um, Intel QAT cycles that you get back to improve the backup performance, uh, free up those cycles by offloading the backup compression, uh, reduce the demands on the processor, and then uh, dramatically improved the backup speed. We're, we're, we're seeing 2.6x on, on, the, on the previous Sapphire uh, 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 Rapids? Or yeah, the code name Sapphire Rapids. Hardware. Um, and then we're seeing a further 20% gain on that, on, on, on what's just been uh, shown. So it, we have a... Because we plan to to um, to to release more of these uh, hardware accelerators, we have this kind of master on/off switch, um, where where we um, um, sorry, this is this is the uh, this is what you would think will be the master on/off switch. Um, but is actually the instance level switch, um, and then we can, uh, if it doesn't find the the actual hardware, it will it will fail over into a software mode. But you can also 
even if you have the hardware, you can you can force it into a software mode. Um, and the idea is that uh, you know drivers fail, drivers get patched, um, and so forth. Um, uh, this is a new DMV uh, DM uh, server accelerator status. And this just verifies that the uh, SQL has loaded the QAT assemblies uh, uh, into memory. Uh, very, very simple. Um, not, not much changes to the actual backup statement itself. Um, we have, you know, weight compression, and then we've added, we've added this. Uh, uh, status where we set we, we specify an algorithm and possibly in the future we'll look at uh, doing uh, further algorithms there as well um, and all, all your regular backup commands all, all work uh, header only um, and then restore, we don't need to specify for, for restore, we don't need to specify what the algorithm that was used was, because just like, uh, okay, uh, oh, okay, uh, must be missing a slide. Um, just like just like um, in in regular compression or no compression, it's that's stored in the met metadata of the actual file itself, and uh, we read it from there and and then decide uh, how we want to uncompress the file. Um, some uh, possibilities for the for the future. Um, looking at uh, uh, Microsoft proprietary accelerators, uh, AVX five twelve was mentioned. Uh, enhancing security features, um, and and a whole lot more uh, more to come. And I'll just quickly go through another feature, which is another announcement to backups um, in uh, SQL Server 2022, which is T-SQL snapshot backups. Um, and the, the, this concept has been around, if you've had a, a high-end SAN, this concept's been around for 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 a while, where the sand does the VDI, and um, uh, basically it's all managed from the from the application. We suspend, uh, we cast the I/O, uh, take the snapshot, and then uh, uh, release the backup. Um, in in this case, where what we're what we're doing is we're allowing through T SQL to allow you to uh, allow you to basically build your own uh, custom uh, custom solution. Um, and one of the interesting things is uh, so metadata only uh, uh, format. So so when it's taken the the backup of the database, it only needs to take the metadata. We still rely on the actual store uh, storage platform to take the uh, to handle the VDI integration. Um, um, we can group uh, databases together, and um, this uh, mode copy only is somewhat superfluous because. It's implicitly uh, uh, issued at the uh, when we alter uh, suspend for for snapshot backup, um, and then uh, yeah, this is a more complicated restore. 
as, as you can see, we can do all, all the usual things. We can move databases. Uh, we can move database files. We can rename databases as we restore them and so forth. All right. Okay. Awesome. I got my own mic. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, so uh, yeah, thanks to my co-presenters for, for going through all that. Um, so today I'll be talking about uh, Arc Enabled SQL Server, uh, or we also call it SQL Server Enabled by Azure Arc. Both terms, they're interchangeable. Uh, we're in the process of converting our brand name over to uh, SQL Server Enabled by Azure Arc. So uh, you'll have to forgive me if I am still in the old vernacular, um, but it is the same. So. Uh, just out of curiosity, before coming to Pass Summit and maybe hearing about Azure Arc in the keynotes, how many of you knew about Azure Arc or use Arc enabled SQL servers? Okay, almost, yeah, the majority of people, awesome. So for those that don't know or, you know, just learning about it this week, um, you know, SQL servers enabled by Azure Arc, imagine that you are a DBA and you have hybrid and multi-cloud data workloads. What do I mean by that? By a hybrid data workload, that could mean that you have some of your data workloads running in Azure, uh, but maybe you still have some on-prem SQL servers, or you have SQL servers running at the edge. Maybe you have some SQL servers running under your desk or under your daughter's bed. You know, who knows? It doesn't matter. Uh, the challenge becomes, how do you gain visibility and manage those uh, SQL servers in these hybrid environments or multi-cloud environments, multi-cloud meaning you know, you have SQL servers running in AWS or GCP. Uh, you're trying as a DBA to bring simplicity uh, to the complexity of your, your hybrid and data workloads. And maybe you're encountering some of these challenges that, you know, we've, you know, learned from some of our customers. You want to have a single view of all of your, uh, your IT assets and your, and your data workloads from a single point of view. So making it easier to manage, monitor, and administrate uh, the SQL servers or your servers or your Kubernetes clusters. Azure Arc is a platform that allows you to connect a, a variety of off Azure resources to Azure. Uh, and you know, after you Arc enable those resources, those servers or your SQL servers or your Kubernetes clusters, you can start to extend some of the cloud services to better manage, protect, and govern uh, those Arc enabled resources, including your SQL servers that you enable by Azure Arc. And uh, maybe you can't, uh, you know, can, we kind of talked about this a little bit. Maybe you're in the path to migration uh, to, to migrate to the cloud, uh, but you can't migrate everything overnight. It's a, it's a long process, of course. So while you're in the process of migrating, or maybe you're not planning to migrate, how do you still manage and secure all of these data workloads so that you have, you know, 360, uh, coverage of, of, of all your data workloads, uh, regardless of where they're at. So that's really where SQL Server enabled by Azure Arc comes into play. And we kind of already talked about um, this, that you have resources that are existing outside of Azure. Once you Arc enable them, you can start to deploy, you know, those resources then become uh, Azure Arc enabled infrastructure or devices or data workloads. And then you can start to extend some of those uh, Azure Arc enabled services like Defender, like best practices assessment, like the built-in inventory tools that you get from the Azure portal so that you have that comprehensive overview of all of your data workloads and uh, IT assets. And really, there's kind of three main pillars that uh, we like to talk about when it comes to Arc enabling your SQL servers. And the first, over on the left-hand side here, is the ability to manage your entire SQL server estate using Azure Arc. Well, what do we mean by that? As soon as you Arc enable your resources, they'll show up in Azure as if they are Azure resources, but in reality, those data workloads, those SQL servers, they still exist in your own data center. They still exist in your edge locations. They can even still exist in uh, third-party clouds like AWS, GCP, but they are connected to Azure. We're not migrating your data. There's no migration happening. It's simply a connection to Azure so you get that single control plane to see all of your SQL servers, regardless of where they're actually located. And you can use the inventory tools, like I mentioned, like being able to kind of split things into different subscriptions, you know, maybe to align with your different business units, organize them into resource groups, using the tagging features within Azure uh, to kind of help, uh, you know, bring 
uh, you know, consistent management to all of your SQL servers. The middle pillar here about control and governing the entire data estate, uh, you know, we're able to use services like Microsoft Purview to help you, uh, you know, make sure that your data is in compliance with uh, government regulations and things like that. Uh, you can use Purview access policies to make sure that the right people are accessing the right data at the right time, no more, no less. And then the third pillar, you know, security is always top of mind for everyone. It's, it's foundational to operating data workloads. You can use uh, Microsoft Defender. It's the same Defender product that we use to defend our past, you know, Azure SQL offerings. You can use that same Defender product to protect your SQL servers, uh, regardless of where they're at, on-prem, at the edge, or in other clouds. You can also use for SQL Server 2022, uh, a great feature that we announced last year is being able to use uh, Azure Active Directory, or now we call it Microsoft Intra ID. Uh, it's a, another brand name change to basically uh, securely uh, authenticate users into your, into your SQL Server again for, for 2022. And this week, we, there's a whole host of features that we announced for, um, for Arc Enabled SQL Servers. Uh, they got announced in the keynote. Maybe you've attended a couple of other presentations about Azure Arc. And these are kind of the three hero features that we, that we announced here at, at Pass. And what I'd like to do is kind of just walk you through those three uh, features. And, uh, you know, as, as my presenters mentioned, we'll take time for questions at the end. Uh, we're looking pretty good on time, so we should have plenty of time for questions at the end. So let's start with the first one, extended security updates that are enabled by Azure Arc. So uh, SQL Server 2012 is obviously out of support. It's been out of support for a little over a year now, uh, but lots of customers, they still need those uh, extended security updates to make sure that those SQL servers are secure. Maybe they need to attest that they you know, still have coverage uh, for whatever reason. One of the really great things about Azure Arc, and you can only get this after you Arc enable your SQL servers, is you can get kind of a more flexible billing model when it comes to your ESU purchases. So historically, you have purchased, or DBAs and uh, IT administrators have purchased these ESUs in, uh, you know, kind of as a, at the beginning of each year, you buy it in bulk, right? And you have to pay for the whole year, kind of like the, you know, insurance premium on your car, right? You pay for a whole six months or a year, whatever the case may be. We're bringing, what we're doing instead is if you uh, would like, after Arc enabling your SQL servers, you can choose to have your ESUs enabled by Azure Arc. And instead of paying all upfront, you actually pay on a monthly basis. Uh, now, when you first enable your SQL server, you do have to catch up. There is kind of a, a one-time catch-up uh, cost to basically uh, bring your ESU up to date. But going forward, you will just pay on a monthly basis for those ESUs. And the really cool thing is if you are already planning to migrate or upgrade those SQL servers to a supported version, that billing will automatically stop as soon as you migrate to Azure or as soon as you upgrade to a supported instance like 2014, or we've been talking about 2022, we'd love to see you on there. And that billing will automatically stop. So this is a great option because, you know, historically you've had to pay for the whole year and that's money that you spent. And uh, there's really no motivation for you to upgrade because, you know, the, the SQL server is covered for another year, right? But if you're already uh, planning to migrate, uh, in the next year, this is a great option because that billing will automatically stop as soon as you uh, upgrade your uh, your SQL Server or migrate it to Azure. So, and uh, when you Arc enable your SQL Server, another key benefit is those patches are automatically deployed to your SQL Server. So you don't have to take care of the patching uh, if you don't want to. Uh, as I mentioned, you can cancel any time, and the billing usage will stop immediately. Migration stops the charges immediately. And um, I think this is, this is something that we're planning to continue. Uh, so next year, obviously 2014, we'll go out to support and we are planning to offer kind of the same uh, process for SQL Server 2014 as well. So we're just kind of getting started with 2012. This just got announced uh, about a month ago. And uh, you know we are planning to kind of continue this program for SQL Server 2014 and going forward. Uh, and then the other thing that I'll mention is this uh, Windows server also announced a uh, Arc enabled uh, ESU program as well. So similar idea for Windows server as well. You basically pay for those ESUs on a, on a monthly basis uh, versus all up front. So that's what I have about Arc enabled uh, extended security updates. 
Another really great feature that we announced this week uh, at Pass is uh, a SQL performance dashboard, which ties in nicely with all the, all the performance metrics that we've been talking about, uh, especially for SQL Server 2012 and running on Intel. We have now announced, you know, we've been working with our customers and, you know, they've told us, hey, you know, Microsoft, this is great that I'm able to see all my inventory. It's great that I'm able to defend all of my data workloads. Uh, can I use Azure to monitor the performance of my SQL Server? And historically, the answer has been no, but now the answer is yes, as of this week. So let's talk about that. So we have just announced a SQL Server performance dashboard that's available through Azure Arc, uh, has just launched into public preview. And right from within the Azure portal, you can view some of these uh, metrics that you see on the screen here. You can uh, view metrics for active sessions, CPU utilization, data storage utilization, memory utilization, so on and so forth. We're also collecting uh, metrics about all of your database, or a lot of your database properties and weight stats. We don't have visuals for those yet. We are working on them, so those are coming soon. And uh, I did just want to make note that you know we're not collecting any sort of PII or personally identifiable information or end user identifiable information or customer content from your SQL servers. We're not collecting query text. We're not looking at the data. We're simply just pulling. Uh, and actually, let's let's move to this next slide to talk about how it works. So how does this work? So here in the lower left corner, let me see if I can get the laser pointer to work. Yes. So here in the lower left hand corner, these are your Arc enabled SQL servers. And there is a extension that's running on your Windows server and it's running a, a monitoring agent, which is collecting DMV data as well as the service logs for the extension and securely sending those up to Azure. So down here below this kind of dotted line, this is you, the customer. And above this dotted line, this is Microsoft. So this data is automatically being collected for you. It's being sent up to an Azure telemetry pipeline. And then you as the customer, you're able to go into the Azure portal. And I'll, I'll give you a demonstration here of this in just a second. And uh, basically, once you load up the Azure portal, we'll securely access the performance data that we have for that resource and display a performance dashboard for you. Um, so yeah, and this is all, it, th another really great benefit of this is, you know, you as a customer, you don't have to log into the SQL server to run the DMV queries. You don't have to uh, log into another system to uh, use the performance features over there, or, you know, maybe a manager wants to go look at it, but they don't have a login on whatever tool you're using today. They can simply just go to Azure and see this performance dashboard uh, right out the gate. And just kind of continue on a little bit more about how it works. The collection is actually automatic for eligible SQL Server instances. So what, is, what do I mean by eligibility? Well, you do have to upgrade the SQL Server extension that's running on your Windows Server and make sure that it's updated to the latest release, the release that's uh, come out this week in November. If you are already running Arc Enabled SQL Servers, that extension uh, is usually upgraded uh, automatically by default, and it can take up to about four weeks or so since we do follow kind of safe deployment practices. But if you're eager to get started, you can actually go ahead and upgrade your SQL Server extension uh, today. Usually in most regions, you're able to upgrade that. Uh, the collection is automatic for enterprise and standard editions. So just as we're getting started for the public preview, we did go ahead and decide to, we did make a decision to limit it down to just enterprise or standard editions for now. Uh, we are considering whether to expand this to other editions. So, but if you're running enterprise or standard edition, the collection will be automatic. You do need to be running on Windows. And then uh, kind of the final requirement here is when you go into the Azure portal after you arc enable your SQL server, there's kind of a little wizard that you have to go through where you have to set what's called the license type. And the license type has three options. One is license only, which means you're not paying for any software assurance on that SQL box. It's pretty common for, for dev boxes. You can choose a pay as you go option. And that's something that we announced last year at C for SQL Server 2022, is instead of paying for your software assurance, your license all up front, you can choose a pay-as-you-go option and choose to pay for, uh, you know, pay for what you use effectively. So if you tell Azure that you're using the pay-as-you-go option, that's great and you'll be able to use the SQL performance monitoring. Or the third option and the most common option is you as customers, you've already paid for the software assurance on those SQL Server instances. You just have to tell Azure, hey, I already have a license with software assurance. You check that box, you don't pay anything extra, and the SQL performance monitoring will automatically take place. So, 
And then, uh, you know, a common question, of course, is, you know, what is this going to cost? Uh, right now, during the public preview, there is no additional cost to uh, using the SQL performance dashboards. Uh, when we do go to GA, we, uh, we haven't made a determination if there will be a cost, and if there is, how much it will be, so stay tuned on that. Uh, but regardless, you know, me as a PM, I want this to be a, a really good value add to, to you as customers, so we're, we're going to try and keep the cost uh, as low as possible uh, if there's no cost at all, because you've already paid for software assurance, um, so stay tuned on that. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to take a quick pause here from the PowerPoint and switch over to Azure and actually just kind of show you what this looks like. Maybe. Yes. All right, we're out and we're here and let's see if the Wi-Fi is working. Okay. So I'm here in the Azure portal and if you all haven't seen what, uh, what it looks like when you arc enable a SQL Server, Basically, what you're looking at right now is I'm looking at an individual uh, SQL Server instance that's been ARC enabled, uh, as you can see here. So you can see this appears just like any other resource in Azure. And uh, what's happening here is there's some high-level metadata that's being collected about my SQL Server. So I can see that this is a SQL Server 2019 edition. It's a or sorry a version. It is running a standard edition on Windows. Uh, I can see you know how recently it's been connected and so forth. And I can see here, you know, this license type is being set to so uh, license with software assurance. So I met the four criteria that, and this is the extension version that I was talking about. So the extension, everything should work here. Everything's all checked off. And what you'll see here is over on the left-hand side, there's a new option here, in addition to some of the other options we announced um, this week for availability groups and backups, which I think we'll talk about in just a second. But there's a new performance dashboard that you can go on here. And again, I didn't have to do anything to set this up. I didn't even set up this dashboard. This is automatically set up for you so that right when you come to this view, you're getting a visual of uh, some high-level performance metrics about your SQL Server uh, that's you know, connected to Azure Arc. So it's very simple, it's very straightforward. And here I can start to see some of the key metrics like memory utilization, CPU utilization, looks like there was a, a spike uh, about an hour ago. I would need to maybe go investigate what happened there. But I can uh, also scroll through here and see uh, I.O. for data and log storage uh, over time. I can see storage utilization for my logs and data. I can see the number of active sessions. I can see if the log file size is staying consistent. And, uh, you know, it doesn't stop there. I can always add a chart. And uh, once you add a chart, you can kind of see the breadth of metrics that we're collecting. I actually already added, uh, added a couple here, so they got removed here. But in terms of performance counters, everyone's always interested in performance counters. We are collecting about 60 different performance counters, um, both from the common and detailed set. And uh, I could just go on here and you know, take a look at uh, you know, log file size used, and I can add that on here. Um, so yeah, I can see you know, how much of my log file size is actually being used day to day. And uh, you can always remove any charts if you're uh, not interested in them any longer. And this will persist kind of, you know, session to session for you as well. So, and um, you can, uh, right now, you can go back about uh, to the last 24 hours. We will slowly expand the time range uh, as time goes on. But uh, for now, we can go back to the last 24 hours, or you can zero in down to the last 15 minutes if you wanted to. Uh, right now, we are aggregating up to a minute interval, but we'll provide some more options in the future. And then if you wanted to, by default, we're looking at all of the databases on the SQL instance, basically aggregated together, so the SQL instance as a whole along all of these metrics. But if you wanted to look at a specific uh, database, for example, and the performance metrics that are related to that, you could certainly zero in on that database. And you could see here, you know, for example, the data storage I.O. rates are now specific to this uh, AdventureWorks database that I selected uh, there at the top. So yeah, and uh, you know, we're just getting started here as far as performance uh, monitoring goes for our enabled SQL servers. We have a whole host of features that we are that are in our backlog and we're we're starting to get uh, get get working on them. Alerting is obviously a key part of observability when it comes to your Arc enabled SQL servers. There's no alerting functionality today, but we are working on it and hope to get something out in the first half of next year. Uh, as I kind of showed you, that performance dashboard, that's specific to an individual SQL server. Uh, we do plan to provide kind of a at scale view of all of your SQL servers, so you can kind of get a, a single view, uh, making it easier to kind of get, get visibility into how multiple SQL servers are performing. 
Uh, being able to securely query for long-running queries. Uh, so, you know, I mentioned earlier that we aren't pulling in any customer content. I mentioned that we're not pulling in any query text. So we are working on uh, devising, uh, you know, designing a, a secure solution to be able to pull in long-running queries so that you can see right from within the Azure portal uh, what are the long-running queries uh, so that you can go and investigate it further because we know that's a key aspect to uh, basically performance tuning on, on your database. Uh, I did mention today, you know, the data store is managed by Microsoft and uh, we do that for, you know, the convenience of the customer so there's nothing really that you need to set up. And in the future, we'll provide a way for customers basically take a copy of that data into your own data store and uh, you can do what you want with it. You can retain it as long as you want. You can send it out to other monitoring solutions that you might be using, uh, so on and so forth. So uh, stay tuned on that one as well. Uh, migration assessments, that's something that we will also be providing to customers probably in the first half of next year. So what that means is we are going to be using the performance data on your SQL Server and uh, you know CPU utilization, storage capacity, storage usage, things like that. And we will run a migration assessment using uh, kind of a trailing 30 days of your performance data. And we will present to you within the Azure portal a migration assessment to let you know the readiness of your SQL Server to migrate to Azure SQL Database or Azure SQL MI, Azure SQL VM. And it'll say, hey, you're ready to go to Azure SQL VM, click here to get started. Or you know, if you're wanting to get over to Azure SQL DB, you're not quite ready yet, it'll give you a, a laundry list of things they need to go and check out to, to get ready. So we're really excited about that. So stay tuned for more uh, information on that uh, to help our customers you know, make the migration process smoother uh, as much as we can, because we know migration projects uh, can definitely be arduous. So, and then uh, you know, there's a whole host of other features that we are planning in kind of the observability and monitoring standpoint. You know, being able to view the logs in the Azure portal, so you're not having to RDP into the SQL instance. We want to make it easier for you to get support from Azure uh, if there is an if there is a if there is a situation that you do need support on. You know, how cool would it be if you know the logs? If you and the, and, and the uh, support agent, you're looking at the same logs, you're looking at the same, same telemetry, so you're not having to send logs back and forth. Or maybe you go to the Azure Support Center and you say, hey, I'm having this problem, and it automatically suggests some solutions based on the telemetry that's been collected on your SQL instance, kind of helping you to self-resolve your, uh, your own troubles as well without having to wait for a support agent. So like I said, we're just getting started. We're really excited about the performance improvement, or sorry, the performance visibility that we're providing to Arc enabled SQL servers. Uh, so yeah, definitely watch this space as we continue to evolve our performance monitoring uh, aspects. Yeah, I'll take a question. Yeah, so we're rolling it out. Uh, so any region that is supported by Azure Arc today, which is, it's on our documentation, it's all the, it's all the big regions, you know, uh, any region that's supported by Azure Arc today, this will work. Yep. After this uh, starts to roll out. So, okay. So the last thing that I'll talk about is uh, enhanced HADR management directly from Azure. So this is another common situation where DBAs they're having to RDP into their instances and set up availability groups, trigger failovers, uh, things like that. Set up backups. Uh, what we announced this week. Let's talk about automatic, uh, let's talk about backup and, uh, and restore here just for a second. So automated backups, they're going to be built into the Azure portal and we can jump back to the demo here in, in just a second. Uh, they're built in, but they are disabled by default. And we did that intentionally because if you already have a backup solution in place, we don't want to conflict with what you, what's going on, right? So, uh, and basically from within the Azure portal, you can choose the default schedule. Uh, we're basically taking a, a weekly full backup, a daily differential, and a five-minute T-log backup. You can customize that schedule according to your liking, and I'll, and I'll show you what that looks like. And then you can set up a retention period for your backups uh, anywhere up to uh, 35 days, basically. Uh, right now, we are only supporting databases in full recovery mode, uh, just as an FYI. And uh, this is a pretty common question, so I'll just address this one right now. We're basically using, this isn't a backup to Azure, this isn't a backup to an off-prem storage solution. It's basically helping you to manage whatever storage um, you've pointed your SQL Server at. It will, it will still continue to take the backups to that storage area. So this is simply kind of a, a management tool. So again, you don't have to RDP into uh, your SQL Server and set up the backups. You can do it all from within the Azure portal. 
You can be at a coffee shop in Hawaii and, and you know, manage your backups from there. And then obviously the other side of the backup equation, the other side of the coin is being able to restore. Uh, why take backups if you can't restore them at some point if you need them? Uh, and basically there is a wizard in the uh, portal that allows you to set up the, or sorry, trigger, uh, sorry, pick the date that you want uh, for your restore and trigger that restore process right from within Azure. So I'll show that to you. But before I get to that, let's talk about availability group inventory and status. So again, uh, you know, DBAs, if they want to know the health of their availability group, one of the, oh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's see. So the UI is basically, you know, database by database. And, but I believe there is a way to do it at scale using Azure CLI commands. Um, yeah, so you can do it, you can do it at scale for sure too. Sure. Can you extend one, yeah, you, the point in time, oh, can you extend past 35 days? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so today for the kind of the initial uh, preview, uh, it is up to 35 days. We might extend that to 90 days uh, or further. So yeah, stay tuned on that. But for now, we support back to 35 days. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, awesome. So no other questions? This is a wide view here, so. All right, so let's talk about availability group inventory. So uh, as I mentioned, DBAs, you know, one way to view your availability group inventory is to RDP into that uh, SQL server and get that inventory status and so forth. Uh, we are basically taking that same uh, set of information that's available in the SQL server, and in real time, we're actually pulling that into the Azure portal so that you can see from within kind of a, a single pane of glass the availability group inventory and the status of that inventory. Uh, and you can actually uh, trigger a, a failover from within the Azure portal. So let me jump out of the presentation one more time, and let me see if I can show you some of that here uh, live. There we go. Okay. So similar to what I showed you for the performance dashboard, yeah. There is a couple of other options here. So let's look at the backup option first. I don't think I've actually set up a, a backup on this uh, SQL server. Oh, yeah, we have. Okay, awesome. So if I haven't, I could actually click here and configure my policies on uh, on this instance. So it is, sorry, instance specific uh, to set up the backup policy. I think I said database specific, but yeah. It's instance specific. You can set how long you want to keep the point in time restore backups. You can obviously turn them off by setting this to zero. And then as I mentioned here, uh, this is the default schedule. Uh, full backups every seven days, differentials daily, and T-log backups every five minutes. But you can uh, adjust these uh, to your liking. Uh, differential, you can only choose between 12 and 24 hours. And then full backups, you can choose uh, to do them daily or uh, as, as uh, less frequently as weekly. And then you would just click apply and the backup policy would get applied to all of the databases on this instance. Uh, but again, the database does have to be in full recovery mode. We don't have support for simple recovery mode yet. Uh, and then let's say you do need to trigger a restore on that database. You would simply click that restore button there you would pick the date and time that you want to restore it to, and you'd give the database a new name, and that restore process would get triggered on your Arc-enabled SQL Server. So yeah, very uh, slick way to be able to kind of manage your backups and restore processes from the Azure portal. Don't think I have an AG set up on this instance, so bear with me one second. Let me switch over to another one. It's this one. Yes, should be this one. Okay. So what's happening with this availability group? Okay, so this is interesting. Okay, so the availability group, uh, I mentioned really quickly earlier that this is being pulled in real time. So just a heads up that, you know, right now we're not storing, you know, any information about the availability group uh, with data at rest. This is actually a real time query that's running on your SQL server to get this information. And it's not working right now, unfortunately. But I think you can kind of, I can kind of paint a picture. Actually, let me just switch back to the slides here. That's why we take screenshots. <laughs> let me see if I can maximize this a little bit. So basically what's happening here, oh yeah, there we go. 
So when you are on your Arc Enabled SQL Server and you're on this availability groups option, you can see right from within the Azure portal which is the um, which is the primary, what's the cluster type, what's the health of the availability group, and uh, you know you can basically see the availability group replica and you can see that it's healthy. These will show red. You'll see red on the screen if things are unhealthy. Uh, it's largely a replication of what you already see in SSMS today. But again, you don't have to RDP into the into the SQL Server. You can manage this all from within Azure. And then here, kind of on the top left here of the screen, there is the option to trigger the failover to the secondary uh, and basically trigger that process to run on the SQL Server uh, itself. So, so yeah, that's a little bit about uh, availability, availability group inventory and backup and restore. Uh, like I said, new features that we announced this week in addition to the performance dashboards that I talked about uh, a little bit ago. And that's kind of all I have uh, for now. So we can take some questions if there's any from on, on any of the topics that we talked about. <laughs> yeah, do we have the, got the audience mic? Yeah, keep going. Yeah, there so um, for the new Intel processors, is there a difference in price point? I think you're good. Is this microphone on? Go for it. All right. So um, I don't know. I'm an engineer, <laughs> I'm a yeah, marketing yeah. or sales guy. So uh, I assume so, right? Like, but you know, uh, uh, the announcement is going to be coming uh, towards the end of the year. So okay. keep an eye on it. Thank you. Uh, just two quick questions. Sure. Uh, what was the name of the DM view in order to find out whether or not the QAT was installed? Oh, um, Ryan, do you want to answer that? The, the top of the, I, I don't know, the top of my. I tried copying it down, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Little, little, Didn't little, write little fast enough. Next. This will show you if the accelerator of loading is enabled. Top of that, um, can I think also see all the available accelerators if they are individually turned? And if you go Currently, there's only one accelerator okay. supported. Right, Mike. Oh, oh. Sorry. <laughs> Currently, the question was, um, do we have more than one accelerator? Currently, we have uh, only one accelerator, um, but, you know, watch the space. Thank you. And the second question is, I see where with ARC I can restore to a new database. Mm -hmm. uh, what about restoring to the current database for replacement? Yeah, good question. So we don't support that today. We're just kind of following the you know, standard best practices to restore to a separate database so as not to disrupt the current database. Um, but I can take that back to the, the PM team to talk about that and see if that would be an option. Cool. Yeah. switch maybe write some automation to yeah that's what we have recommended to a few customers to restore in a new name and then uh, switch that back to the old name if that works out that seems to be working for some customers but uh, in place rename is is hard it can be done but it's hard <laughs> yeah just a quick question on the the arc stuff <clears throat> So when you're doing like a failover or a restore or whatever, what credentials is that using? Is it who's logged into the portal or is it like a service account? No, good question. So yeah, it's using a, a service account that's uh, operating under kind of a lease privileges model that we're rolling out. Yep. 
So historically, just to provide some history, we used to do a lot of stuff through NT Authority system. So obviously that's a super powerful user. And uh, you know, we had some customers that uh, you know, had some concerns about that naturally. So we started rolling out a, a lease privileges model where basically the agent will be granted just the permissions it needs to operate whatever, uh, whatever thing it needs. So yeah, so it's a low level, just regular system account. Yeah. And then there's a question here. Yeah. Uh, can you enable the QAT on uh, virtualized workloads as well or only on bare metal? No, you, you can you can embed uh, enabler on uh, virtual machines. Um, so um, <clears throat> when when you when you install it on the physical host, it then grants you the right to install uh, thirteen virtual um, uh, QAT uh, devices and. You can even install it with no hardware available, um, but you you won't be offloading at that stage. You'd be using your your own processors, but that's that covers the failback scenario. If there's not a oh, got one more in the question. back there. Um, if you're uh, if you're doing on-prem pay as you go through Arc, and you have like a communications disruption, I'm assuming there's like a grace period before it shuts down your SQL Server. Or... Oh, I see what you're saying. In terms of um, yeah, if you lose connectivity to Arc, and Nanje, keep me honest here. If you're on the pay-as-you-go model and you lose connectivity to Arc, the billing meters stop on the Azure side, so you're not paying for that that chunk of disconnectivity. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. The uh, server has to get connected and upload the billing data uh, within that period of time. Yeah. Is that so, 45 days? So if it's momentary, yeah, 45, it's not a big deal. I think 30 to 45 days. Yeah. And after that, uh, uh, we have a little bit of degraded. You'll first start getting warnings and then it will, it won't shut down the server but you won't be able to get the arc related functionality. We don't want to disrupt SQL. Sure. Uh, <laughs> we just want, you won't get the new services related to it. Yeah. But the data will be buffered yeah. on the usage and when it reconnects, it will upload. So you will, it catches back you up. will get charged <laughs> once we catch up. Yeah. yeah. What other questions do you all have? I'll ask a question to the yeah, sure. <laughs> crowd. Um, so we talked about QAT. Has anybody tried to uh, do a compressed backup using the QAT, new, the, the new compression method? Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> uh, so today. one question that you might ask yourself is like, how is it going to work? Like, I don't have a hardware. I might have hardware on my production, but not on my you know, test platforms that I want to restore. Right, so um, essentially it's a new compression method, like it's a different data format. It's not gonna be compatible with your express format, which is the default format, but essentially the, 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 the solution involves two parts, right? One is the hardware acceleration part, which you may or might not have, but there's always gonna be a part of the software equivalent of that compression. So even if you had a high hardware or you, you know, uh, do a backup, compress backup, you transfer that backup to another machine that doesn't have the hardware, you can always lean on that uh, software solution to restore your database without, you know. That's why we are, like, you know, um, we'd like to, you know, tell, tell SQL users, go ahead and try it. You don't need the hardware today. Uh, but obviously, you'll get the, also the benefit. And you have the hardware acceleration. Yeah, the only thing it won't do is um, cross-platform backup. So you can't back up from Windows to Linux. Or vice versa, but um, if you if you take a backup with with hardware, it will restore with software. Can I uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's not supported on the Linux distribution as of yet. Yeah. Yeah. Another watch your face. Yeah. 
Other questions? Awesome. Well, then I'll leave you with this. Uh, thank you for attending today. We appreciate your time. Hope you're enjoying the rest of the, the past summit. Here's a link that you can go and check out all the announcements, you know, including the ones that we covered and more. And then, uh, of course, we always welcome your feedback uh, on this session. Uh, please, uh, you know, feel free to leave us an evaluation. Let us know how we did. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next year. Thanks so much. Thank you.